I received a question a short while ago regarding the calendar correction that I had mentioned in a video. So essentially what happened is um, there are a lot, of, we're told that the Antichrist is going to try to change God's appointed times and he's going to try to mess with his calendar and all of these other things. God established a Hebrew calendar. That calendar is based on a 29 day month or a 30 day month based on the moon. Your new moon feast is the head of the calendar. That is the first day of the month when the moon is completely dark. That's the first day of the month. And that's based on 29 days or 30 days. So a given year is going to have about 355 days, 355, not 65, 355 days. Now, just as Christianity has counterfeit Christianity, Judaism also has counterfeit Judaism. And I've spoken to you before of reformed Judaism and that movement that happened. You know, I've talked about Wissenschaft des Judentums, the movement, the science of Judaism in Germany that was going on just before World, World War II. And what was happening is that certain Jews were trying to make Judaism palatable for the world or, or try to make themselves feel better in the world. And so they started combining science and Judaism, science, the thing that, you know, the thing that denies that there's a God, denies that there's a creator. So Reformed Judaism has done a lot. And they have all kinds of texts that are, you know, rabbinical commentaries. You've probably heard of many of them. There's no other text that we need except for the word of God, except for the Bible. That's it. But what has happened is that these rabbis have been trying to make a name for themselves instead of being concerned about the things that God established, Reformed Judaism as well, they didn't want anything to do with the divine revelation and traditions of their ancestors. They wanted to be like the world. So you have all of this defilement happening, people changing the scroll, people rejecting the authority of the Torah, people rejecting the authority of divine revelation and of the patriarchs. No, they didn't want that. So you have a bunch of people who are wise in their own eyes, no different from what's going on in counterfeit Christianity, same darn thing, making up their own doctrines. God says, return to me. He doesn't say reform. So if you're reforming, either you're making something for yourself, you're making something that you're more comfortable with because God's word is either not enough or he requires too much, or as in counterfeit Christianity, your focus is on the devil in in Catholicism, for example, and that's what you're reforming. That's what the reformists in Catholicism, were, in, in uh, counterfeit Christianity were doing. They were making a name for themselves. John Knox, Calvin, Wesley, Luther. We never should have been following these people. God says, return to his word, return to his spirit. Paul said, you don't say that you're following Paul, Peter, or Apollos. Apollos planted the seed I watered it and only God has been making it grow. He made it very clear early on. But this is what counterfeit Christianity decided to do. Go chase after man, chase after man. And when you don't like it, well, no problem. There's plenty of men to chase after or just make your own doctrine. And that's exactly what counterfeit Judaism did. They made their own doctrine. Wissenschaftus Judentums, the science of Judaism, the Talmud, which is nothing but a bunch of commentaries of man. Wh who's man? Who cares? Does Christianity do that? Do they chase after those who are wise in their own eyes, who have gone to a university? Most universities, by the way, are run by Catholicism and Christian universities being even more dangerous because everyone's called Christian and yet there's all of these different denominations and traditions. How do you ever come to agreement? No, you just water down the truth in order to all get along. We should be studying the word of God and that's it. The word of God and that's it. So here's what happened with the calendar. A bunch of rabbis got together and decided that they were going to add another year into God's Hebrew calendar in order for it to line up with the Gregorian calendar, the Gregorian calendar that tried to abolish God's calendar. So I guess if you can't beat them, join them. How does that work? So they added in a leap year. And during that leap year, there's a second Adar, month of Adar that's added in. So sometimes you have a 12-year month, excuse me, a 12-month year, and sometimes you have a 13-month year. Huh. Well, how does that work? with regard to God's holy days. How do you know if you're celebrating God's holy day on the correct day? And the answer is we don't anymore. Unfortunately, we don't. And so I was realizing that on the other video and I was very upset because no matter how hard you try to seek truth, there's a battle against it and it's super upsetting. 
it's super upsetting for those of us who are trying to ad- to maintain and adhere to the truth. Well, here's the thing. I had a feeling that this question was going to come up and I received this question a little while ago about um, the calendar discrepancy. And this person was wondering if it, if um, because of this, does it affect our appointed feast times? And yes, it does. I can't tell you how to handle that. This is something that I'm praying about and asking God, show me if there's something that you want me to do here. But the best I can do at this point is to get to the best approximation. If that changes, I will let you know. But this is the best that I can do right now. And the best approximation that I have right at this moment is whatever I find on Google. If someone has another solution, then let me know. But I want to tell you something else. When I go on Google, I am very careful that I do not ingest anything else that people say. There are a lot of websites that have this so-called Hebrew calendar, and they have a lot of commentary and other things that they, that they have written on there. You need to understand what I'm saying. Reformed Judaism is a thing. And those who do not, did not accept Christ are enemies as far as the gospel is concerned. They are loved on account of the patriarchs, enemies as far as the gospel is concerned, because they don't accept him. They don't know him. They, and if you don't accept Christ... God is not in you. John says that's the spirit of the Antichrist. If you don't accept Christ, God is not in you. Okay, so this is not a message against certain people. What you need to understand is that there are certain people who've been hardened who are going to accept him in the end. So you pray for that and you love them. But as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for our sake. So the way I'm handling this is I'm going to continue to observe God's holy days with the best approximation as I have available to me. And God is going to honor what is in my heart because he knows that I am seeking truth. I'm not doing what's comfortable for me. I'm seeking truth. One of the things that this person did say is that something that was brought to her mind was that God allowed this for a purpose. And she was wondering if God allowed this so that people would not try to go around calculating the exact date of his coming. Well, people have done that no matter what. They've continued to do that no matter what. They've continued to come up with theories and everything else. People are going to do that, whether the, ca- the calendar is correct or whether it's not. But it's a good thought. I mean, it's a good thought. And, and one thing I want to say about this person's heart is that that's where they go. There's something about their heart that that's where they go. Do you understand how when, when God is in your heart, how that's going to come out in your deeds and your thoughts, the way you think about things and the way you talk? That, that is what is in this person's heart. So I want you to recognize that because I want you to understand what needs to be coming out of you. Immediately, when she sees that something's going on, she wants to understand, huh, wonder what God's doing here. And, and remember, you know, we don't want to come up with theories apart from God. We want to ask him. But that is the best, like, first thought that's going on. What, God, what is God doing here in everything? Oh, I have a, you know, last night, I was coming out of my, uh, we've been having really bad rains here. And so I covered up like with plastic again, I have a, you know, I'm on a mountain. So I, my house kind of slopes and, uh, and there's a slope into the back part of my house. So everything's sloping into my foundation. So I set up some plastic, like some tarp kind of things and some sandbags. And when I was coming out of the house, I went to grab a, a turkey to can and I fell flat on my, I slipped on that plastic because I had it on the step of the back step and slipped right onto my bottom. And the jolt was so hard that it just, it like messed up my, um, my, sp- I could feel it in my spine. I could feel like the jolt that happened in my head, not to mention I was soaking wet because I fell right into the water. It was just a mess. But first thing I'm thinking is, okay, what is God doing here? I had just heard from someone, some, you know, some news about um, what, you know, some information that they had received from a doctor, a medical doctor. And I was deeply distressed and I immediately was, was, had brought that to God and said, you know, I can't make anyone have eyes to see. I can't make them heal. This is something that I need you to testify to. I need you. And I was praying for this person and I was asking him if I've been wrong, you let me know because I will, I will own up to that. I will say that I was wrong, but I don't believe, I don't believe I'm wrong. Your word says you are our healer. Your word says you will not put any diseases on anybody if they follow you, if they maintain what you have commanded. So why? Help me understand why. 
And no sooner was I praying that did I fall. And the first thought that I had was, okay, God, what are you doing here? In fact, I even said it as I'm sitting on my butt in the puddle. What are you doing here? It needs to be our first thought. It needs to be not only our first thought, but then our, we need, that thought needs to interact with our heart. And you know, my foot started to swell and I, and I sat there thinking, I'm not going to the hospital. I'm not going to be treated by a doctor. I know what you've taught me. I know what I teach others. And I'm not a hypocrite, so I need you to heal me. And I was in some pain. I was in pain all last night. This morning, my foot is completely healed. And let me tell you something, I hit it hard. I still have a little discomfort in my back that really I only notice when I'm like kind of stretching and trying to see, do I have any discomfort? For the, but for the most part, I'm healed. And I'm reminded of so many other times where I've done something and he healed me. I turned to him and I remind, and I, you know, worked my heart and said, hey, I'm not going to the doctor. I'm not going to step apart from you. I know that you created me. I know that you can heal me. And he's walked me through the process every single time. He's told me how he was dealing me, with me. He's told me what it was that he was teaching me. So that's what he was doing last night. I got, I don't even want to say that I got scared. I got nervous for like a split second, but I felt peace wash over me immediately because I know that God is my healer. I know that God is my healer. And I really needed just for him to remind me of that in the moment, that he is my healer. And that when I turn to him, when I trust in him, when I receive whatever he's doing, when my first thought is, what is God doing here? Is he rebuking me? Is he building me? Is he pulling me in close? Is he disciplining me? When that's my first thought and I go to him and I receive that from him, he heals me. He relents. And if he does it with me, then he will do it with you. So please remember to have a heart for God. Remember to make sure that you are staying close to him and that you are always seeking and pursuing his heart. If it's hard for you, then pray, ask him to turn your heart and he will, but you have to receive it. You have to remember that when he's turning your heart, he might send you some, some uh, grief and that grief will be necessary for you to be built for the very thing that you prayed for. Keep perceiving what he's doing. Don't let anything in life happen and think that that's something that's apart from God's sovereignty. God is sovereign over all. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.